Hey, welcome <coughs> back, everyone. Um, our next speaker is Alexander Moten from IX Systems. So I'm going to turn it over to Alexander. There you go. You uh, hello. Yes, I am. I hope all you right. hear me and see my slides. Yes, it all looks it good from here. Okay, great. Uh, so, my name is Alexander Motin, and uh, today I'm going to talk about my uh, work on TrueNAS uh, within IX systems uh, during the last year, maybe and a half. I just groped some interesting things, and that appeared to be over that time frame. Uh, briefly about myself, I am FreeBSD Committer Science 2007. Uh, I started work on originally on networking, but then migrated to many other areas. Last time, mostly working about storage, but not only. I work for IX Systems since 2009, uh, originally as just FreeBSD committer. And uh, this time I am team leader of OS and services team. Uh, briefly about TrueNAS, uh, it started as FreeNAS uh, in 2005. In 2009, it was uh, taken over by IX Systems and was rewritten a couple times after that. Uh, in 2013, uh, was started appliance-based edition called TrueNAS, uh, which was FreeNAS with added uh, high availability support based on uh, CARP and later Iskazia Lua. And, and and other features important for enterprise, such as uh, enclosure management, uh, monitoring, and other things. Uh, last year, uh, it was rebranded as TrueNAS Core for Community Edition and TrueNAS Enterprise for Appliance version. Uh, and this year uh, was started a new project known as TrueNAS Scale uh, with the idea of scale out uh, clustering. Uh, based on uh, Linux Debian, uh, just due to uh, limited functionality of FreeBSD in area of uh, clustering, clustering file systems. But that's not topic for today. Uh, TrueNAS Core Enterprise at this point are based on FreeBSD 12.2, uh, but uh, we are doing a lot of backports from upstream, so uh, most don't be surprised that you see FreeBSD main on uh, today's slides uh, from many related points. Uh, they are very close. We have a lot of backwards. The idea to migrate to FreeBSD 13.1, I release it in spring uh, in next uh, TrueNAS 13 release. Uh, scale is Debian. Uh, scale is based on Debian 11, but it's not yet released. Hopefully, again early next year. On a uh, functionality side, obviously, uh, TrueNAS provides all kinds of storage access, such as SMB, NFS for file storage, iSCSI and Fiber Channel for block storage, S3 uh, protocol for object storage, and many other things uh, beyond that. Uh, it, it provides application uh, storage as in the form of many plugins available uh, for users on top of FreeBSD jails, same as raw jails. Uh, it provides virtual machine support through Beehive and again, many things behind that. Uh, IX Systems supplies a big line of uh, hardware products just to be able to uh, provide customers reliability and support. Uh, starting from smallest Soho systems to bigger, to pretty big uh, M-series flagship high availability systems uh, based on Zion Gold and lots of RAM and lots of everything. But uh, to, to be fair, 99% of users of a community edition use uh, their own hardware. Uh, and that creates a lot of surprises <laughs> for us to maintain all kinds of uh, hardware. But once again, uh, for a better uh, results, the better to use qualified hardware. Uh, of course, no uh, NAS could exist without file systems. And in 2005, FreeNAS started with UFS support, which, which had no much other alternatives. Uh, then uh, a few years later, thanks to Pavel Davidek, uh, FreeBSD got ZFS support 
in the form of custom port. And in 2010, uh, Freenas switched to using ZFS and it's primary citizen now, practically the only file system supported as primary storage. The other could be imported, but uh, no more than that. Uh, last year, uh, very big thanks to Matt Macy and Ryan Murray who driven that project. Uh, there was a reintegration of FreeBSD ZFS and uh, ZFS on Linux into what's now known as OpenZFS 2.0. Uh, hopefully, the more operating system will join that project. There are ongoing work uh, on Mac OS X, on Windows, but they're not in main tree. Hopefully, they will be there soon. Uh, so, idea is for this year, we have uh, all the platform uh, core enterprise scale of TrueNAS plus FreeBSD and uh, vanilla Linux all, run, all be able to run same OpenZFS 2.1 with pool uh, migratable between all the platform architectures and fully compatible. So uh, FreeBSD stable suite we already have OpenZFS 2.1. Uh, FreeBSD main tracks OpenZFS master uh, thanks to Martin Matushka who maintains uh, its up-to-date with upstream pretty regularly, thanks again. Uh, but enough marketing, let's go uh, look on some fun. And the biggest fun for me is uh, performance analysis. And my favorite area is iSCSI target of FreeBSD uh, backed by ZFS of FreeBSD. So in this test, I'm using a pretty much uh, top of the line uh, system as target. Obviously, it can't uh, be utilized by the simple desktop initiator I'm using here, but it's enough to demonstrate uh, performance bottleneck issues, scalability issues. And obviously, for uh, internal testing, we're using big cluster of initiators to really make that system busy. But single initiator is also important thing since not so many deployments can actually provide multiple initiators at the same time, multiple workloads at the same time. So I'd say it's, it's important by itself. Uh, as base point for my uh, numbers, I used I took uh, FreeBSD main from uh, June last year. Uh, it uses native FreeBSD ZFS and CTL as iSCSI target. So I used the NVMe pool. I uh, limited arc size just to uh, force most of these, most of disk accesses go to to the to, to disk, to pull, to SSDs, uh, to test the worst possible case with minimal caching. And I run a sequential 256 kilobyte read write, which are appear to be the best combination for Windows after some tuning. Because as I've told, Windows is a bottleneck here. But you may see that I reached about uh, from up to four gigabytes per second uh, write and below three gigabytes per second Oh, four gigabyte read and uh, below three gigabytes per second write. Uh, but that's not as interesting as looking inside. That's my favorite part, uh, looking on uh, CPU profiles and other kind of profiles. This is a read profile. You may see number of uh, big blocks here is where uh, CPU time was spent. And let's quickly look on each of them. The most annoying part was uh, time spent in CPU idle. It, I found it only early this year, just bef because before that, my uh, profiling script, to be fair, was just ignoring that part. I considered it to be not interesting, just polluting the graph. But actually, after I started to look on this particular workload, it burned too much CPU and for absolutely no reason. That part was optimized and disappeared and shouldn't exist uh, with newer build. One of the uh, interesting effect of this bug was if you are trying to ping remotely 80 core system, uh, ping would reach almost like 100 millisecond or a second, I don't remember, some very huge numbers because it tried to wake up all 80 cores same time and they created huge low contention. It was pretty bad, but fix it now. But probably not so <laughs> interesting uh, for real life, but a really interesting bug. Uh, then next step, was, we can see here uh, time spent in ZFS, and there are four bars, one of which you can see in red uh, is a Fletcher checksum, and obviously it's a feature, we can't give up on it, uh, it's accelerated as much as possible, uh, but what we can look uh, on is our four, um, three blue bars, uh, memory copies done by ZFS, and we can see here uh, three of them uh, from uh, right to left. 
uh, one a memory copy is done for IO aggregation scatter gather, which is uh, done from when they data copied from large aggregated IO into separate uh, ZFS blocks. Uh, second bar is copying from uh, ARC cache of ZFS into DMU cache. Uh, in this, instead of this copy could be actually decompression if data are compressible. But on this, on this test data were not compressible, uh, just to illustrate uh, kind of worst case. And the third copy is from DMU cache to actual application, in this case into CTL. Uh, of course, it's three memory copy uh, is too much, especially if we go, if we're reaching uh, very high speeds where memory uh, can become a bottleneck. And we saw that kind of problems in our tests, just increasing on a big system, increasing from four, uh, from using four channels of memory to 12 ch channels of memory, significantly improve performance. So memory can be a bottleneck and uh, obviously we should avoid extra memory copies to save both CPU power and memory bandwidth. So uh, I'd like to thank Brian Atkinson of OpenZFS. That's one of benefits uh, integrating with uh, bigger team uh, who implemented uh, platform independent part of again the ABD implementation, which is practically a scatter gather for ZFS. And I was able to integrate that with uh, functionality of FreeBSD known as unmapped IO. It's just, it's, it can be confusing name, but, uh, but, but it really it can be used for scatter gather uh, uh, IO on FreeBSD with one limitation that IO has to be page aligned. But since many disks these days are optimized for four, K, four, four kilobyte blocks, uh, Trunas also tuned by default to use four kilobyte allocations in ZFS. And that's not a problem. All of our IOs are page aligned. So at the end, uh, this one of this copy disappear. Uh, it would be great if uh, one day we implemented universal scatter gather support in our block storage, but that would require work on all layers in Geom, in Chem, uh, in uh, hardware drivers. And obviously it would work only for hardware that support, support that kind of scatter gather, even latest NVMe. Uh, has support in specification for that scatter gather, but not all devices support it. And maybe even less for older hardware. So while well, it would be good to have that feature, it's it's future work. Okay, another memory copy can be seen uh, when data are copied from uh, CTL buffer into chain uh, of memory buffers for TCP transmission. Uh, that's how it was code was written originally, but I found that it's possible to create uh, memory buffers uh, with external storage directly on from uh, the CTL buffers, which are 128 kilobyte in length or even bigger uh, these days, uh, and that significantly improves a lot of things. The problem here uh, is that uh, number of old pre bus DMA network drivers expect physically continuous and buffs. And the biggest pain we had on that front is CXGB driver, which uh, from one side is 10 gigabit uh, driver, uh, 10 gigabit hardware, and uh, it's still quite popular. On other side, the driver is pretty old. It's not uh, bus, it doesn't use bus DMA. And we, community users, uh, thanks to them, uh, reported us several uh, memory corruptions, which we were able to identify a limit to the driver and fix the driver. So now that's fixed. On my review of uh, kernel sources, uh, we should have at, at least several potential potentially broken driver, but all of them are 100 megabits per second and pretty old. So they are irrelevant for iSCSI, but I hope uh, they ACB fix it one day or remove it, whatever come first. Network people are welcome. Uh, Next part, uh, next bottleneck uh, or limitation is in network stack, TCP stack, uh, where we have uh, per connection uh, TCP logs. Of course, situation is much better when we have multiple connection, but how uh, especially interesting one uh, client situation that it demonstrates worst possible case. And number of optimizations uh, were done there. Uh, what, what it was from one side improved by using large buffs, which uh, improved a lot of things in TCP code when it tries to 
uh, traverse through the list of m buffs instead of traversing page sized m buff, it now can traverse huge 128 kilobyte m buffs, plus the code aggregates, uh, send and receive requests uh, that also reduces log pressure. And yeah. Uh, one thing is not visible on profiles, but that I should mention uh, is a IO size limitation that FreeBSD always had and known as max fees uh, kernel option. And why it's important is because uh, ZFS, while by default uh, uses 128 kilobyte blocks, uh, it can be tuned and for better efficiency and performance to use up to one megabyte blocks or potentially even more if somebody want to go that high. It improves compression, it uh, reduces overheads, many benefits if the workload really fits that tuning. And uh, on other side, ZFS aggregates consecutive IOs in up to one megabyte uh, to make disk scheduling for hard disk more efficient. Uh, ZFS also has own in IO scheduler, which tries to control uh, IO depths for different kinds of traffic to uh, reduce potential starvation and in, in, in introduce priorities, kind of. Uh, so based, based on all of, all of that, uh, for to reach be best results, OS should not fragment IO at least up to one megabyte. And it was my uh, dreams for many years uh, to make FreeBSD use one megabyte IOs. Uh, and it was approached on many uh, fronts, but very big, uh, big sense to Constantin Belousov, who finally helped to do heavy lifting uh, and uh, remove max fees from parts of kernel uh, where it doesn't belong, such as VFS, uh, UFS code, some NFS in that front, uh, which is not my primary area of expertise. And now we have it, uh, instead of kernel uh, option, we now have, have it as loader tunable. And for 64-bit uh, architectures, it's set to one megabyte, which is uh, great. Uh, after that, I, I was able to uh, do a number of improvements to CTL and the CAM subsystem. Also, uh, thanks to some uh, community users of FreeNAS, uh, or Turnas Core now, who reported problems uh, with different hardware, I was able to fix MPT, MRSAS, MPS drivers, and made some improvements to NVMe to support larger IOs. One thing is also, also not visible on profiles, uh, but important for real-world performance uh, is quality of service. Uh, ZFS, as I've told, as I've told uh, has internal scheduler uh, and it differentiates up to nine types of IO, which call their priorities, but it's more like types, uh, that which I would separate into three level of priorities, uh, synchronous to be executed immediately, asynchronous, uh, interactive, which should be executed within seconds or milliseconds, and asynchronous non-interactive, such as scrub, which can be executed within minutes and without significant ill effects. Uh, the problem with the FS scheduler is that it doesn't know uh, disk internal specific. Some disks may prefer deeper queues, some disks prefer more shallow queues, lower, shorter queues, uh, and uh, DFS tries to do something in between that's difficult. On other side, uh, disk internal scheduler can be very efficient, but it has no idea about traffic it receives. And uh, we found that uh, during some workloads, in particular, if you're trying to do some random IO and in parallel run ZFS scrub, random IO may experience delays up to four seconds, which is clear and acceptable if you're trying to run uh, VM on top of that. That's why I spent a few months investigating area of disk priorities. Appears that uh, most of st storage protocols such as SATA, SCSI, and VME all has some sort of priority in specification. For SATA, it's pretty minimal. It's just normal and high priority. For SCSI, it's uh, more, uh, SCSI has more layer, layers, in particular 15 uh, layers of priority. Unfortunately, not very much specified. Just say that higher level of priority should, hit, should be executed faster. That's all. And the second problem with SCSI is that I haven't found any uh, SCSI disk that would actually implement SCSI priorities. The only exception uh, is translation layer of uh, SASH or some SASH BA, which can convert SCSI priority into SATA priority. 
which is in turn supported by some of uh, SATA disks, not all of them, but some are supported. And the VME specification also uh, has concept of priority, but it's implemented pretty different. Instead of uh, having priority uh, per request, there is a priority per queue. And to use it as request priority, there has to be number of queues uh, instead of one with different priorities. And it's uh, kind of difficult from one side. And uh, uh, it's honestly much less needed for very fast NVMe on the other side. So uh, while working on this, I implemented support for priorities into uh, CAM for both SCSI and SATA. Hopefully one day that they can be useful unless we all move to NVMe or somewhere else before that. I want to thanks to Mohamed Ahmed from Seagate who supported uh, me on this project. And I hope uh, they will one day release some hard disks where this functionality could be used because it would be really nice. Without that, I tried to work on software side. And first thing obvious, I found that uh, for years we had a uh, car limit in our IO sorter. Uh, but that was never enabled and I found it's critical uh, if we have disks without hardware queue support, which is still we may see sometimes for USB devices since we don't support uh, UAS protocol for USB storage. So that would be good to fix by itself since there are a number of uh, Freenas Trans users are using USB storage just trying to, but we had to discourage them from that. Uh, another thing I fixed uh, is uh, improvement fix for that mentioned problem of with latency of, uh, of mix of sequential and random workloads. And I implemented on ZFS uh, in ZFS scheduler. So now it should be able to detect a starvation of uh, interactive workload when there is uh, non interactive workload goes same time and it will intentionally throttle non interactive workload until. Interactive one is served. Uh, of course, it's that could be it could be done better if supported by uh, the hardware. So if we could tell disks which request are which, and it could schedule them more efficiently. But I found that this patch alone reduces maximum uh, IO latency uh, from almost four seconds down to a quarter second or less. So it's sixteen times reduction. That's great for such a small change relatively small. Uh, I also worked on uh, prefetcher and now it should much better handle uh, parallel workloads, uh, which we often see in case of iSCSI and SMB that uh, can now execute multiple requests request same time, even when they belong to same initiator and same stream. So it should, prefetcher should do much better things, uh, better work and uh, still less affect uh, workload performance like CPU consumption. And now should be improved in a number of ways. So uh, that's what we see if we repeat the same test as shown before, but on FreeBSD main out of a couple months ago when all those changes were integrated. It uses OpenZFS 2.1 and same CTL as target with some optimizations. You may see it not double, but pretty close improvements and mostly thanks to uh, remove it additional memory copies and other optimizations also. Uh, here we may see profiling uh, for case of read. We can see only two memory copies left. Potentially one of them could be um, uh, avoided if we disable scattergather, also known as ABD arc, and we give up on compression. But that means uh, additional KVA mapping and mapping on allocations and KVA fragmentations, that's not great and make a cost problems. That's why that we don't use that by default. So we're still having two memory copies per, per uncached IO. Uh, on right, uh, if you look from the beginning, we may see most of the same problems as was on read. Uh, and after changes, we may see only three memory copies left two in the FS so now uh, one uh, left in iSCSI receive pass that still copies from uh, TCP buffers into CTL buffer. Uh, science we can uh, hardware generic hardware can't uh, implement zero copy receive. Uh, it has to stay like that. Uh, but uh, thanks to John Baldwin who implemented or updated 
uh, Chelsea or Iskazia float. Uh, we can now do that in hardware, at least on Chelsea or Nix. And you can see on this profile that first, uh, almost all of network, or network CPU time just disappeared on the left side of the graph, close to nothing. And on only two memory copies left. So copied from TCP stack to, uh, to CTL buffer just disappeared. Data directly written by hardware and two CTL buffers. That's pretty nice. Uh, but as I've told previous, in previous case, we've built, been bottlenecked by initiator. And in this case, uh, I propose quickly look on uh, row ZFS uh, benchmarking when just test run by local fire doing first uh, sequential and then random IO. You may see that ZFS itself is able to reach pretty high speeds. Uh, in this case, I use it uh, 10 NVMe SSDs, uh, not uh, top of the line kind of consumer, top consumer, I would call them. And I see, you may see that on uh, old FreeBSD, I was able to reach something like 15 gigabytes per second read and about 12 something on write, uh, which is pretty uh, high, but never, it's always want to see more. Let's look, uh, what do we have here? Uh, we may see that uh, doing a 15 gigabytes per second read, uh, we only use 13% uh, of CPU, uh, which is pretty low and another, another confirmation that we are drive bound. And out of that time, 40% uh, spent on uh, memory copies. Obviously less memory copies are great. Uh, and 20 by checksums. Again, we can't do much about that. Uh, maybe we could offload that to some accelerators, uh, but they're pretty quite expensive and rare. Uh, so recently we got drivers for our Intel accelerators in FreeBSD. Maybe we could integrate them into ZFS to do checksumming because Fletcher is not that bad even. Uh, if we start doing the dupe and using a SHA-256 or SHA-512 checksumming, uh, in that case overhead grows dramatically and even with CPU float. And in that case, maybe some additional file, even faster float by specialized hardware could be beneficial. OpenZFS supports uh, that kind of acceleration, but it needs to be integrated with drivers available on FreeBSD. Uh, in case of writing, you may see it's slightly faster than reading. That's uh, interesting effect, probably uh, because ZFS balance uh, write traffic between drives with a, according to their speeds and drives in the system were of three different kinds. That's why. Uh, on the right, the FS could achieve higher bandwidth than on read when uh, it has to read the data from wherever they are, not from wherever it wants them to be. So in this case, of course, uh, CPU over here is higher, 35% uh, CPU usage, 30% uh, consumed by memory copy, 15 by checksums, and here we start seeing low contention, uh, primarily around task queue. Implementation, that's why I over the years or several times try to optimize it here and there. Unfortunately, uh, in some cases, uh, ZFS has to use single task queue, in particular during write. Uh, it uses single task uh, queue for, for all writes to not reorder them so that uh, writes reach a disk in sequential order and don't fragment allocation on disks. Uh, that's not great, but that's what it is. Uh, hopefully, it could be optimized one day. Uh, so, uh, there were, uh, on top of sequential IO optimization, there were number, uh, I've done a lot of uh, random or IOPS optimizations, primarily targeted for lower CPU usage to reduce log contention in different uh, places, or just reduce CPU usage just by avoiding duplicated operations or merging them together. It was done about this summer in June, I think. Uh, it's all upstream in, uh, uh, in OpenZFS and merged to FreeBSD. Also, science and goals about pretty high uh, scheduling rates. I had to do a number of optimization. In addition to mentioned task queue, there were also a number of optimization to scheduler here and there. And uh, as we see later, there's still some space to go. You may see here uh, updated numbers uh, with uh, with new system uh, showing higher IOPS number, of course, still bottlenecked, but uh, 
that are quite fundament fundamental now we may see. Here is profile for uh, reading, random reading from ZFS. And you may see quite a lot of small uh, CPU usage places. And, uh, but one of biggest actual contention, uh, limitation points uh, is ARC reclamation. The problem is that uh, ARC design as it is done now doesn't allow multi-threaded ARC reclamation. So a single thread can't handle more than about 400,000 blocks per second. Uh, that's why it's kind of bottleneck, which is not even limited by general system usage. The bigger system is, the more cores it has, the, the more important it becomes. So I tried to do some optimizations there, but it needs more architectural changes into arc design of ZFS to make it make its parallel reclamation possible. On the right, uh, there's other bottleneck. Uh, we have uh, single thread. Uh, no, at least it is, it is single thread in case of uh, the walls used in, the, in this test. DFS only synchronizes one uh, the wall at a time. If uh, used not the wall, but files on data sets, it can flush several files of same data sets at a time. But there different bottlenecks appear. That's why, oh, and we don't recommend using files for, for back in SCSI. That's why I was testing uh, the walls. So in this case uh, with blue arrow, you may see uh, that time spent uh, in, si in single thread bottleneck in one CPU uh, doing uh, processing all the issuing all the rights, all the block rights uh, uh, for the pool. And uh, actual bottleneck here for quite a while been about quarter million blocks per second. It's not even uh, in some. IOPS per second, at literally blocks per second. Uh, no matter what size of you of block you are use, starting from 4K to one meg, you can do more, more than one quarter million blocks per second. From that perspective, using bigger blocks beneficial. But like for blocks about 32K, it's possible to reach pretty high numbers. So it's not a huge problem, but it is a problem. Uh, of course, there are still some log contentions left, but uh, significant part you may see them here, them here in red. That's a, a space accounting of ZFS when it has to account how many blocks allocated frees and so on and done that uh, for all the uh, three hierarchy of uh, data sets and Z walls. And that gets pretty expensive science. It's practically global lock per pool locks uh, if we are going to the root data set. But uh, not all of our problems, not all of our work are related to performance. Uh, there's also uh, a lot of hardware work in particular to go to enterprise area with NVMe, we had to implement a PCIe hot plug. Uh, science NVMe is, is kind of standard for high performance these days. And we need to replace fail, failed drives uh, in, in a real time without reboots and so on. So I had to work on this area. First problem I had to solve uh, is uh, NMIs sent by hardware or BMC in key, or by, by platform in case of PCI error on NVMe unplug. And obviously we can't crash on almost every NVMe unplug. So we had, I had to implement a driver for a CPI platform error interface. It may be uh, not full featured, but it's enough to intercept those particular errors and report them as uh, just errors by kernel, not kernel panics. And if errors are incorrectable, at least they are decoded better than just NMI. It will point where exactly error happened to on what device, so provides debugging information. Potentially the driver could be extended to support uh, native uh, PCI Express error reporting if platforms allow that, but platforms from Supermicro we use don't allow that. So uh, it's not implemented at this point. Also, uh, in addition to, the, to handling errors, we need to actually configure device on hot plug. We first receive hot plug events from platform and then process them. Uh, I found that number of system cooling hours don't allow hot plug events unless OS report it supports ASPM. Uh, and we don't actually need ASPM uh, in Science it's, uh, controls uh, power consumption, but we had to fake that 
to actually receive hot plug events. Next problem appeared as max payload size of PCI Express that has to be negotiated for all devices within a PCIe hierarchy from the single root. Uh, I implemented a small patch to handle basic cases, but it could potentially be improved uh, to handle all the hierarchy for more general purpose case if you are not hot plugging single drive, but whole NVMe J bot or something like that. And also we fixed a couple issues here and there that allows us handle uh, most of cases. Unfortunately, there remain a pretty big issue is that uh, some systems do not reserve uh, resources for PCI Express slots if devices are not inserted during boot. Like you boot it without any NVMe and then try to insert them. And it appears that BIOS reserve it like, like one megabyte while you have several layers of bridges. Each tries, each requires its own one megabyte and the PCI subsystem just has no memory to allocate to inserted devices, in particular bridges signs them, them require full megabyte. And that problem is, is not solved at this point. So we had this limitation, you can unplug any drives, but if you boot it without the drive, you cannot plug it in. No, you can plug it in, but it won't be detected until you reboot. It's better than nothing, but it's not good. So, uh, Anybody who has good ideas how to handle that are welcome. Uh, Linux implemented through uh, resource relocation support, which is pretty uh, complicated process of uh, suspending uh, other devices if they are on a way uh, relocating their resources, uh, resuming them. But that may be the only way to handle it. As an alternative, I investigated the possibility to use VMD driver, which is Intel uh, CPU rate support uh, for and VME, well, potentially not only, but practically all, all it does is that it hides uh, PCI Express sub three under fake device of VMD and BIOS reserves some memory like 32 megabytes for that device. So it allows to solve a uh, resource allocation problem and it works in that way. Unfortunately, it creates some other issues. Uh, one of them, uh, one of which is uh, Interrupt, interrupt sharing size since that virtual device has only limited number of MSIX vectors. That's like, I don't remember, like 30, 33 in one case on one hardware, 19 I saw on different hardware. So it's not very high. And uh, with big system, it's possible to get bottleneck there oh, and interrupt sharing as a result, which is expensive. But it works now. I driver was significantly refactored and could be. Very useful for for people doing using dual boot with Windows, which may require VMD enabled by default. I found that on my new laptop, so it's not only helpful for hot plug but for other areas too. Also, uh, since we are supporting community users up to some degree, we have to handle a lot of hardware issues for different drivers we don't even use ourselves. So uh, we are regularly fixing some uh, SAS disk detection hot plug issues uh, in drivers we use. Uh, we also I also fix it uh, number of problems in other drivers we don't use in uh, this in uh, some fish fix it issues in the IPMI watchdog uh, in PMS driver was had pretty nasty errors that fix it. And last year I cleaned up ISP fiber channel driver from Qlogic uh, to drop uh, very dirty code supporting legacy parallel SCSI uh, and very early fiber channels. Now it supports all existing uh, fiber, channel, fiber channel cards from Qlogic and doing it more or less nice way uh, open to potentially implement support for multiple queues and other things. So that uh, was my work over the last year and a half. And uh, if you know somebody interested, we are hiring more people to work on such interesting things like that. And thanks everybody. I am open for questions. I think actually we're gonna probably have to take questions to IRC and Slack. Um, just kind of stay with our schedule. But thank you very much for your talk, Alexander. I uh, found it very interesting. I look forward to continuing to work on iSCSI performance with you uh, and other stuff in the future. So thank you very much. 
And now we're going to take about a five minute break. And our next talk coming up after that is going to be a panel focused on ARM64 support and FreeBSD. So I'll see folks over in the hallway track in, uh, for the next few minutes.